Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to today's UCLA Meteorite Gallery. I am very pleased today that uh, Paul Warren stepped in uh, at the last minute to give us the uh, a talk. Uh, I'm very pleased. I've known Paul for more than four decades. Um, and the talk today is Lunar Samples as Grand Ground Truth. I can't read my own writing for remote sensing of the moon's surface. So Paul grew up in Long Island, or he'd say Long Island or something like that. He got a PhD from UCLA in 79, working on Apollo lunar samples. Um, he became a fellow of the Meteoritical Society in 86. Um, I met him uh, when I was a grad student in Albuquerque, University of New Mexico, and Paul was a new postdoc over there. Uh, he's written 130 scientific papers, mostly on achondrites, uh, Apollo samples, uh, Eucrites, other differentiated meteorites, Uralites, Martian meteorites. Um, and he is uh, perhaps the most uh, learned of the achondrite experts, if not the most, certainly in the top two or three. Um, he spent all of his uh, academic uh, life, essentially uh, postgraduate academic life at UCLA, a little bit in New Mexico. He spent one year as a uh, visiting professor at the University of Tokyo. And other than that, uh, for countless years, he's been in the office next to mine at UCLA. Um, Paul uh, sort of be became uh, a hero of the cosmochemistry community after a couple of papers in 2011, when he just used literature data to show that carbonaceous materials and non-carbonaceous materials uh, clustered into two separate uh, regions on various isotopic diagrams uh, showing this fundamental dichotomy of solar system materials, which has been uh, used by many people, uh, people studying iron meteorites, people studying chondrites, modelers, uh, and an awful lot of mileage has gotten out of those papers that he published in 2011. So uh, we all have to be grateful for Paul uh, for that. Um, I, I will not read the titles of his 130 papers as uh, he pleaded with me to do so. Nonetheless, I'll let Paul have some time to give his talk. So please, uh, thank you, Paul. Go ahead, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that over kind introduction. Uh, uh, so this is my topic, uh, lunar samples as, as ground truth. And I wanna, out, from the outset mention, I'm only gonna cover a few aspects of this. And just to give uh, some idea of how important uh, samples are to interpreting remote sensing. Uh, in recent decades, we've been getting a lot of crucial, uh, great science from remote sensing. And uh, that's probably not gonna change going forward. Uh, for other bodies, it's all we're gonna get uh, awful long time, and uh, it's it's important to to appreciate uh, and understand just how the ground truth uh, plays into uh, interpretation of the remote sensing, and it can go wrong if, uh, if people aren't cognizant of uh, some uh, constraints that we can get from ground truth. So I'm mostly interested in the older uh, highland crust of the moon. It, it volumetrically it way dominates. There are these two terrains. Um, the far side that always faces from the earth is, is almost purely the highland terrain. Uh, it's much older. And so uh, you see it's, it's pockmarked really densely with old craters. There is the other terrain, which is prominent on the near side that always faces the earth of these dark lava flows, uh, the maria. Uh, or Mare singular. And uh, they're relatively young and thin. And I'm interested in the bulk composition of the lunar crust personally. Uh, so I'm more interested in this older highland terrain. And uh, I'm interested in the magma ocean hypothesis, which is the, has been ever since uh, a few months after the Apollo 11 samples became available. This has been, uh, the foremost hypothesis for the origin of the lunar crust. Um, it's motivated by 
finding a huge proportion of this mineral plagioclase, calcium aluminum silicate, among lunar surface materials. And uh, the thinking is you, you, you get such a special uh, composition by a special process. And the, uh, the appeal is to the buoyancy of this mineral. Its, its density is a lot less than uh, most silicate minerals made for planetary seeds. And uh, it's probably, and it's a lot less dense than the uh, likely composition of, of the magma for them uh, implied by the composition of the magma uh, that would have produced it. So it would have been buoyant uh, among the, in the lunar context. And so the thinking is this is how the initial lunar crust formed. Um, and that implies that the moon formed very hot, uh, which is of course a pretty important we think bigger bodies probably, if the moon could get so hot, bigger bodies for sure would have. So this uh, is an indication of uh, one result for the bulk composition of the lunar surface, which roughly translates into bulk composition of the lunar crust, uh, we think, very, very roughly maybe, but, but roughly. And uh, a convenient thing is that, um, Lunar mineralogy is nice and simple. Uh, from a terrestrial perspective, on the Earth, you have so much more that can, can affect mineralogy. You have a lot of water circulating around. You have uh, oxygen in relative abundance so that we have, uh, for the element iron, uh, most importantly, instead of being exclusively in the form of uh, FeO, one-to-one, -one, uh, or even uh, iron without oxygen, metal iron, uh, that's what we have on the moon. On the earth, a lot of uh, ferric iron where the oxidation state is higher and the uh, proportionality is two iron atoms to three oxygen atoms. Um, and you have pressure on the earth too, even within the crust that can affect mineralogy. So there's all kinds of uh, complexities that affect terrestrial mineralogy that uh, it's kind of an advantage in a way when we study the moon. Uh, they're, they're not much of a factor. So the lunar mineralogy is pretty simple. You have mafic silicates, uh, pyroxene and olivine. Now these are solid solutions, so they can be complicated um, uh, to some extent. And, and then you have a plagioclase feldspar. Um, that's also a solid solution. It can be at various sodium or calcium proportions. And uh, a little bit of a... a Titanium oxide forms ilmenite. But I use colors here to indicate these, these oxides are have affinity for plagioclase feldspar. And alumina is almost like a proxy for plagioclase. And then these oxides are kind of proxies for mafic silicate. And one thing about the moon is its, its surface materials are very rich in aluminum and uh, plagioclase. Uh, uh, I'll get back to that in just a second. I want to mention though that, so I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, mafic silicate abundance, plagioclase abundance, and alumina uh, concentration in the samples. And there's a pretty straightforward, since we have this straightforward mineralogy, there's a pretty for, straightforward relationship among highland materials, these colored uh, symbols show them. Between the, this alumina uh, weight percent and the amount of, of, of mafic silicate, or in other words, the amount of plagioclase, which is the complementary mineralogy. Uh, and so I will be implicitly using this uh, to talk. Here I compare this surface composition we've already talked about for the moon versus uh, what you get from the uh, HED meteorite parent asteroid uh, Vesta, almost certainly Vesta, uh, we have that pretty well characterized and much higher proportion of the mafic silicates and not so much of this uh, plagioclase. Nervous crust, you have a, a more silica in the continental crust, quartz, and uh, you have uh, more, fair amount of feldspar, but it doesn't reach the lunar. 
So this is the motivation for uh, the magma ocean hypothesis that you have this abundance of feldspar, plagioclase feldspar in the lunar island crust. But just how abundant is it? Well, we rely on remote sensing uh, to a large extent for that. But we do have the ground truth and that comes from the lunar meteorites. And I wanna talk a little bit about the cratering process, which uh, one of the effects of which is to give us these meteorites. So cratering happens all over the moon. And in the past, it used to be much, uh, much more intense at some point. And so the highland crust has, has greatly been affected. So we get these lunar meteorites and we recognize them by various traits. A lot of traits are very special about lunar materials. The ones in red are the ones that we uh, can see among lunar meteorites or, or the, the most definitive things you can do are to measure some isotope ratios. Um, and uh, it's, it, it, it kind of uh, might surprise uh, uh, lay people how little controversy there is among uh, the cognoscenti about uh, identi identifying lunar sample uh, among meteorites. Uh, uh, people who study them, we think, maybe we're crazy, but we think we can recognize lunar meteorites very definitely, and, and we can recognize what is not a lunar meteorite very definitely. But I, I, I can't spend too much time on that. Anyway, we do get them, and we get them uh, courtesy of this uh, cratering process. And so cratering, uh, one thing it does is it spews material out great distances. And we can see that when we go and examine relatively young craters on the moon. And most famously, there's Tycho, uh, which is relatively large and young. And it created these rays um, of, uh, of strewn out material going out to great distances, they can be traced on the lunar surface. This, by the way, is supposedly showing the true color of the lunar surface, uh, somebody claimed. Anyway, that's Tycho. Uh, there are younger, there are younger still craters. They're, they're not as big as Tycho, uh, but there are there are a lot of them that are uh, recent studies with the wonderful Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mission uh, have uh, imaged. Uh, it, it, it's wonderful high resolution. There are young craters and you can see uh, kind of streamlines where material was ejected out into the environs of this crater. And this is the same crater, uh, the, the, the broader image and shows you that these streamlines can be traced out at, at great distance. And we think we understand this process pretty well from experiments and, and uh, modeling. So, a relatively small object hits and starts forming the crater in this position. And then the, the crater, as the crater expands, a curtain of ejecta is spewn out. And the first stuff that comes out is going at a very high velocity and it's gonna go for great distances. And then as the, the crater grows, and uh, uh, these things come out slower and slower, they get further and further from the ground zero. And uh, the, the growth is limited to the point where the the transport is very minimal. So you get some material that's gonna go a big distance, although admittedly most of it piles up not too far outside of the crater. And uh, just wanna show a little video. This can be simulated pretty well in the lab. Now, real quickly, you're gonna see the impactor come in here. It's very, very small compared to uh, what the crater is gonna eventually form. So here's the crater forming and uh, you, you have this ejecta curtain spinning out. And so it doesn't show up, but, but eventually this stuff could go out to quite a distance. And this is using a relatively low velocity uh, impact, but it is uh, the same basic process it's gonna happen. And let's just go to the end here. So um, that's the process. And these are the results. Uh, we now have these spectacular images of this, again from uh, LRO. And this is happening and giving us meteorites even at the present time. So here's another movie. And this is, shows a crater. We're zooming into the location in the 
northwest uh, corner of Mars Serenitatis. And now uh, we get to these new images that are much higher resolution. And during this uh, decade or so where this uh, probe has been taking these great images, a crater formed. You see a new crater here between two different images. And um, the uh, crater left rays, in this case, it's going into a Mara dark drain. So the rays are dark and they go out uh, to great distances relative to this little tiny 12 meter crater. So I show all this to emphasize that besides delivering lunar meteorites, um, there's an enormous amount of lateral mixing, some vertical mixing too, but lateral mixing, especially among lunar surface materials. Uh, the lunar meteorites are a great complement to the samples in the sense that the samples have still uh, only been acquired from a relatively small region of the lunar near side. So this rectangular chart here is representing the entire near side hemisphere of the moon, half of the lunar surface. And the fractions that are encompassed among, if you draw a polygon around the six Apollo sites, the fraction of the surface is, is quite small. The overall global coverage is uh, a 7% from uh, even when you add the other four uh, automatic uh, lander samples. Most recently, Chang'e 5. Uh, I have to mention that there is one complication. The cratering process that delivers these uh, samples at the, uh, is, is not uh, completely uniform. There is a, a bias towards low latitude, I, towards the equator, and towards uh, 90 degrees west longitude, uh, which is the leading edge of the moon as it uh, circle, uh, orbits around the Earth. Uh, but this effect compared to the disparities that I'm going to be talking about soon, uh, this, this uh, 10, 20 percent kind of, uh, if for the most part, effect is, is kind of in the noise. You don't need to worry about it too much. So th these impacts effects uh, include, among other things, lunar meteorites, a lot of mixing. And at very small scale, it, it uh, gardens up the, the material and produces regolith. And uh, the, um, the mixing, you can see that on uh, the scale of individual samples. Here's the largest of the lunar meteorites that we presently have at the UCLA collection. It's still pretty small compared to the total mass of this meteorite, which is many kilograms. But uh, point I want to make is that like a lot of highland materials, it's a jumble of lots of class of older rocks that have got broken up and then uh, jammed together hot and, uh, and compressed and heated and formed into a new rock. So in a sense, within this one rock, we have uh, hundreds of little rocks we can study to some extent. Uh, as a result of this lateral mixing. So that's a nice thing in a way. Uh, at small scale regolith forms, and it forms just about everywhere on the moon. I show this slide to emphasize that even where you have very high slope, this is in uh, the wall of North Ray Crater. Here's North Ray Crater vertically viewed by the LRO camera. And the astronauts, Apollo 16 astronauts, drove their rover up to this uh, house rock, big boulder here area. And they took some pictures. John Young took pictures of these, this boulder rich area there. And that's what you see here. But in between the boulders, you still see very fine uh, material. And that's at least a, a, what we call immature variety of regolith. So this is, and regolith is very thoroughly mixed material one handful of regolith would be, I don't know, many thousands of, of, of uh, originally widely separated bits of rock. Um, well, 
Now I'm gonna to start to talk about a technique called spectral reflectance. It's a great technique in a lot of ways. It has way superior spatial resolution to other techniques that are available for measuring the mineralogy of uh, planetary surfaces. Uh, for the moon resolutions, I've been achieving about 60 meters. For comparison, another really good technique uh, called gamma ray spectrometry, it's spatial resolution. If you push it, you can get it to 40 or 50 kilometers, not meters, kilometers. So about a factor of a thousand poorer resolution. So spectral fractance is really great for a lot in a lot of ways, but it has its limitations. And one of the problems is practically the whole moon is covered with regolith. And I will show this just to mention, I'm gonna talk about this rock later. I just want to point out that if it weren't regolith, it would be a boulder that had been exposed for a long time. And its surface would look like this. It would have a, what we call patina. And I, I've done a literature search. I've seen a little bit of work on the effects of patina on lunar rocks, just on Mara rocks. Or anyway, not a very highly anorthosidic rocks like this. And so you're going to get a very different spectral result from that as what you get from a fresh surface. So that's just the start of the complications um, with spectral reflectance. Uh, great technique, but it has some problems. And I, I, I don't, but I don't want to give you the idea that I'm trying to say that it's junk because I'm going to point out a lot of problems with it. But it's 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 a great technique, but it, it just does have these problems. So ground truth, lunar meteorites. Um, give us an idea of the composition of the surface. Thanks to all this uh, blending and the random, almost random nature of how they're derived by cratering. Uh, this should give us a pretty good feel for the spectrum of compositions of the lunar surface. I've just used all, it'd be nice if I could characterize only the lunar meteorites that are regular wretches, but anyway, this is all the lunar meteorites. And this, all the ones that have been analyzed out of near 500 total lunar meteorites, about 80 of them have been analyzed. Um, now, spectral reflectance, we're gonna compare that with spectral reflectance. Uh, spectral reflectance relies on bands called absorption bands that show up when the sun's light uh, gets reflected back off the lunar uh, solid surface. And one of the bands that you use, that's used is for plagioclase, there's a minor constituent in plagioclase of iron oxide, FeO. And that band produces this absorption here. Uh, the other uh, band that's uh, relied upon uh, very heavily is a band for iron in pyroxene. In pyroxene, it's a major constituent, or olivine too produces a similar band. And uh, that's at about 950 nanometers whereas the plagioclase band is about 1,250. And so uh, the way the game is played, they, they, they look at both of these and they kind of ratio the band strengths and they see a lot more of the plagioclase band and not much of the pyroxene band. Then they think, then they figure we've got uh, a very plagioclase which rock. This is an example of how it can be a problem. These are two very similar mineralogically, uh, lunar uh, pile 16 soils, highly anorthosidic soils, and yet they look very different uh, in, in spectroscopy, the, the spectral reflectance. I don't have time to, to dwell upon this too much. Anyway, about 10 years ago, using spectral reflectance from the Kaguya uh, mission, uh, Otaki et al. published this map. And it, it drove me crazy for years to, to think that uh, this, I, I never believed this from my work with lunar meteorites and, and other constraints. I, I always thought it had to be wrong. And so recently I really uh, subjected it to some scrutiny uh, working with Randy Kordov. And uh, here is an example, the comparison with the lunar meteorites is ground truth. Now that map I just showed does not cover give coverage for the whole moon. For high latitudes, it's just shown in black, but that's a relatively small part of the lunar surface at high latitude. This is not an equal area map. Uh, and then there's a lot of the terrain, a lot of surfaces rich in mar basalt, and that, that adds a complication that 
um, these guys realized uh, really they just couldn't deal with it. So they didn't report any data for that. But for most of the lunar surface, they did report data. And it's all in this range for mafic silicate abundance between four and 10%. Nothing in this, uh, whatever it is, about 60% of this surface uh, that they showed results for is supposed to have less than 10 volume percent of mafic minerals. Well, here, I compare that with, again, lunar meteorites. So that, again, you have the histogram of lunar meteorites, the accumulate, cumulative percentage of them shown in this darker blue as a curve. We don't have a histogram from the Kaguya result because they left out these big areas, but we do know that they, they covered close to 60% of the surface and they had uh, no mafic result um, greater than 10%. And so we translate from mafic abundance to alumina, as I mentioned, and you get this kind of curve here. And that's a pretty big disparity between the two. I'll, I'll explain how it is. Um, for example, if you look at uh, the Kaguya result, it, it shows that 40%, where it's 100 minus the 60 here, 40% of the surface has greater than 31% alumina. Uh, and the corresponding result from lunar meteorites is only 5% has uh, greater than 31% alumina. It's a big difference. Um, another, another way of looking at it is, is sticking with mafic minerals. Uh, the, the Kaguya result, I think, charitably implies nine volume percent. They showed, they showed nothing more than 10, and they went well beyond 50% uh, coverage. Whereas the, the lunar meteorites indicate a result of uh, about nine volume percent when this result is translated from AL203 to mineralogy. Uh, this other technique that I already mentioned is called gamma ray spectrometry. And I don't have time <laughs> to talk about how it works, but it, it, it's, uh, you're looking a little deeper into the lunar surface about a meter now, but we don't expect that to make a big difference. And here are the results uh, for alumina from that technique. As I mentioned, the spatial resolution is much lower, and especially for uh, this particular element because of its nuclear properties, it's complicated. But the spatial resolution here is something like 150 kilometers instead of again, versus 60 meters, as I mentioned. So there's a big disadvantage there, but I think that this is a more straight, straightforward technique and this, this, these results are more accurate. And so uh, I'll, here I show those results. Here we can do a histogram. And the median, remember the ground truth was 26. Median here is pretty similar, 24. The whole distribution is pretty similar uh, to the lunar meteorite distribution. Uh, one more technique I'll mention is that the uh, X-ray spectrometry is used. Um, I don't wanna explain how it works, but uh, here it, it looks roughly similar, but the uh, mode is at a much lower uh, abundance of plagioclase or, or alumina, the median alumina content is only 22%. So comparing these three uh, uh, major uh, approaches to, to constraining the surface composition of the moon, the median from ground truth, 26%, AL203. Kaguya, 31. Pro lunar prospector, gamma ray, 24. And Chang'e, 22. Uh, these are big disparities, and uh, it's even worse when you think about the mafic abundance that's implied, because that's kind of complementary uh, by this here. That's kind of complementary. There's an inverse relationship, and and when you look at the mafic abundance supplied, here's what we get. Uh, I've plotted here the mafic abundance at one particular site from each of these result sets and the median global abundance. Uh, remember, even without total surface coverage, we can get a median result for the uh, Kaguya spectral instead. So here it is way down here. And at the opposite extreme, we have the X-ray result. 
And here's ground truth in the middle. Um, these guys explicitly claim 7.5%. They, they made some effort to use ground truth, but they, they, did, they got it badly wrong. We can, as I mentioned, we can look at the Apollo 16 site. We can look at two other sites, Highland sites, Luna 20 and uh, close to the Apollo 17 site. A little bit of an extrapolation involved there. So here's the, the Kaguya Luna 20 result. Um, less than 10% may facilitate. The actual result is uh, close to 30. So <laughs> huge disparity. Um, I want to know, I, I, track spec reflectance is a great technique. If calibration is difficult, and people have recently published maps where they calibrated it with, with heavy reliance on ground truth lunar meteorites and, and the sample sites and stuff, and they, they produce um, accurate uh, maps. Um, I want to talk about how ground truth show us what can go wrong, how complicated it is to use spectral reflectance uh, as to calibrate spectral reflectance. So uh, we have Apollo soils and uh, we can measure the reflectance off of those soils in laboratories. And it turns out that uh, what nobody maybe uh, a anticipated, the spectral signatures are dominated. They look, they closely match. Um, between the bulk soil, as you measure that, and this fine fraction between 10 and 20 microns. Here, I, I want to plot here is the surface area that you can calculate uh, uh, given the grain size distributions that are measured by sieving of these soils. So in, with hindsight, that result isn't a surprise. Looking at the, 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 the surface area distribution, that should be the uh, mainly giving the signal from, from spectral reflectance. But it's, it's a problem because most of the mass of a soil is up in this grain size near 100 microns. So if there's any compositional mineralogical disparity between what's going to be measured down here by spectral reflectance and where the mass and the volume is concentrated, well, you've got to be careful how you interpret. And indeed, uh, more uh, work with sieve fractions of, of lunar soils shows there are problems. And, and there, there's a range, for example, shown here between, this, this is all, all this data, I'm relying on a paper by Larry Taylor, the late Larry Taylor, excellent paper, but they kind of dropped the ball and didn't interpret the, uh, the implications for spectral reflectance fully. So uh, I've used their data and I, 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 their data clearly imply that the glass component of these highly anorthostatic soils, it's not the case for other soils. They've worked on a lot of different missions, but, uh, but from this one mission with the anorthostatic soils, um, there's a big disparity between the FEO comp content of the glass component of the soil and the non-glass. Well, the glass component can be well over 50%. Uh, and FEO is a proxy for mafic mineral abundance. So there's a big disparity there that I have to be careful with. Uh, from the glass, non-glass, um, there's just a disparity based on grain size. Again, according to this excellent paper here, using their data, exploiting their data, the mafic abundance goes way down from what we extrapolate to be the abundance if we, if there were no glass and, and, and under ideal circumstances, but something we call CIPW. Um, don't have time to explain that very well. But even if you ignore that, there's, there's a, a trend here and the heavy lines are the averages. Uh, that is worrisome if you're gonna be getting data that's mainly coming off of this fraction here. And what you wanna know is the bulk composition you have to know just, you have to appreciate this problem and just what the slope is and it's a problem. Anyway, um, so now I wanna talk about how this, this uh, technique has been used to claim an extremely high purity of mineral state at uh, a few locales on the moon of uh, mainly they're associated with fresh craters 
high slopes on the, uh, on the walls of fresh craters. Um, young features where we, we would expect there might be exposed rock without regolith or with regolith that's barely been processed, what we call immature regolith. And so claims have been made. Here's a map from spectral reflectance. And they, a few of their place, a few of these little locales, pixels, are claimed to have 98% five clips. Another group uh, looked at a bunch of, this is just emblematic of, of about 300 locales uh, that have been studied by uh, uh, the American group uh, using a, a similar technique, uh, spectral reflectance. And they claim that on a 400 meter scale, these are 600 meters each, they saw associated with this crater here, greater than 99% plagioclase. So there's the discrepancy right there. But it, it, we also have samples from the Apollo 16 mission that, that uh, from a cluster of their cosmic exposure, we believe uh, we can identify as having come from here and they average about 88%, I think it is, Feldspar, nothing like this 98 to 99. Also, uh, these places where it's showing up are for the most part not near what we expect uh, for, from the spectral evidence also shows us something about whether it's regolith or rock. And the stuff that is possibly rocky would be this deep red here based on this thing called OMAT. It's a measure of the maturity, of the extent to which the, the soil has been broken down and gardened. And you don't see this super high plagiarism composition in those areas that should be a link to this here. This is link, should, there should be a linkage between this composition, extreme composition and that, and it isn't. And I've looked at 300 of these and you see this kind of problem in most cases. Also, the claim is that these super pure plagioclase, uh, the claim is that, uh, that some people have claimed that this is actually representing the underlying lunar crust and that the overall composition of the crust is extremely high black, it's like 95% and only 5% mafic silicate. Uh, and part of the claim is that, uh, well, we're looking at young places where it's plausible there isn't much regular. But that's not really true either. I look at some of these, a small subset, but still numerous. Uh, we, we have dates from uh, people have looked at the surface density of craters. And so I plot the dates and the implied thickness of regolith using a conservative model. Newer models uh, would make this thickness uh, grow more quickly. It grows quickly, it's not, not at all linear because at first you're pounding into the rock and breaking it up. And later, once, once a little bit of thickness of regolith develops, in ongoing cratering, it has to hit through the pre-existing broken up material to break up the material. And so as the regolith, uh, as time passes, the regolith might get more finely ground up, but you, you produce some fairly well ground up regolith already within just a few million years. And, uh, oh, a cat, my cat's visiting. Uh, so, there's a problem there. Now, they would, some of these people making these claims to these super high north sites would point out that yes, we, we find them in samples. There's this sample uh, from samples from Apollo 16, like this one, this is the biggest. It's almost 30 centimeters. Yeah, well, uh, that's about 30 million times smaller than the volume of a 60 by 60 meter and then 30 meter uh, volume that's claimed for a uh, purest Norsite pan. Uh, we finally just recently got one meteorite out of close to 500 um, that has this composition. You know, so these, I have to move on, running out of time. Anyway, again, if they rely on a band for iron oxide and fried clays. Gee, nobody's asked a question yet. I feel bad. I, I should have should have mentioned. <laughs> well, I'm almost done. So, um, so they rely on a, a plagioclase FeO band. Well, FeO is a minor constituent of plagioclase, 
And the intensity of the band probably is gonna be sensitive to the AFDO content. Well, if you look at the kinds of rocks that include very interesting samples uh, among the Apollo sampling, they do have reasonably uniform FEO content. Um, about 0.1 weight percent is what you find. This is a rock type uh, that's uh, not too badly jumbled up. It's jumbled, these rocks tend to be jumbled. But we think from evidence like trace sidereophile elements uh, that these have been uh, sig very significantly jumbled. So uh, and those tend to have this 0.1% FEO. But there's a potential for a much higher FEO in lunar plagioclase. And so um, the Brown University people studied that. Uh, they synthetically uh, produced plagioclase with different FEO contents. And they found that sure enough, the band depth, the, the intensity of the signal is, uh, has a linear correlation with this FEO up to a point. Um, and so that's a concern unless the FEO content in lunar plagioclase is rather uniform. Well, it's not. Um, I, the first place I went to, to, to check that out was this what I think of as the classic case of a very narcissistic lunar rock that got impact melted, almost all of it melted. And that's a very distinctive texture where you have these elongated plagioclase dominating the rock, um, crystals of plagioclase. And so what's FEO like in there? Well, I found an old literature paper where people study that. And they kind of oversample these grains that uh, are relics and avoided the melting. But uh, the, the typical material that, that, that has this long gate grain shape has a wide ranging FEO content and averages about three to four times this number of 0.1% that's kind of a plausible number for something that's gonna be near pure plagioclase. So that's a problem. And, and I wanted to confirm that. It turns out we've been, I've been working on a sample very similar in all respects, uh, another Apollo 16 sample. And I carefully measured the FEO contents of this plagioclase and got a very similar uh, distribution. Again, uh, for the most part, uh, far higher in FEO than what would be a, a kind of a plutonic plausible result for a surviving plutonic material. And here's one more, I've looked at a lot of them. So this is a pro another, yeah, one more problem. So it is a little cow that's showing an intense iron in plagioclase band, really a place where you have very pure an orthocyte, or is it just a place where the, an orthocyte of rather normal composition got impact melted? Uh, and, uh, Maybe a little boat. Anyway, going back to the lunar mag motion hypothesis, I think that the ground truth is, is telling us that we need to be careful with the re reflectance spectra results. And the bulk composition of the moon is really not that extreme. It's about three quarters, maybe four fifths plagioclase. That's high enough. It still implies a mag motion. It's just not crazy extreme. You know, I could give a whole different talk about the magma ocean, but anyway, it's perfectly consistent with the magma ocean. So, sorry, uh, this took longer than I wanted, but to conclude, um, while all the remote sensing results are tremendous and, especially, and, and spectral reflectance is especially great for its spatial resolution, it's unequal spatial resolution, we have to be careful and uh, the ground truth from meteorites and uh, Apollo and other acquired samples have important lessons. Um, for the bulk composition, lunar meteorites, uh, uh, I think are, are telling us that story better than any of the remote sensing, frankly, um, especially better than the reflectance, some forms of the reflectance spectrum. Uh, the, uh, okay. the, there are these ground truth constraints uh, where 
it turns out that grain size fractionations are very important. Glass, non-glass, compositional fractionation, very important. So uh, for interpretation of these purest, so-called purest and orthocyte locales, it's important that uh, I, I be happy to pontificate about this more, but this, this maturation index uh, is available and it, it's not good, looking good for this interpretation of these, res these results as pure in orthocyte. And there's this complication of the FEO contents in the plagioclase. The magma ocean hypothesis is in fine shape, at least from this standpoint. Um, there are other complications, but I don't see this as, as a worrisome complication. Uh, and I don't want to uh, go into these tall weeds, but there are implications even for the bulk composition of the moon. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd love to uh, answer your questions. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Let's have everybody lots. give him a little hand, if we could. Uh, before we Thank do you. the questions, and Julia, I don't handle those, I have uh, an announcement. I noticed that yesterday uh, they uh, dropped an announcement in the Meteoritical Bulletin of a new a 39 kilo lunar meteorite from Mauritania called hey. 001. That's described as thrown a thrown north site melt for itself. So a single specimen, it's the fifth largest lunar meteorite that was approved yesterday. Oh, that's uh, and, great. And I have a question, Paul. Uh, there's 1.7 kilos of the Chang'e 5 samples that were brought back. Uh, are there any data on those? And if so, how do they compare with the other data from Apollo and Luna? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. Well, the Chengi 5 samples, the 1.7 kilos, oh. are there any published analyses of those and how do they compare if they are published? Yeah, they're just coming. But uh, remember, my, my focus in this work is on the older highland crust um, and the bulk composition of the crust. The bulk composition is almost completely dominated by the highland material. The, the, the Mara materials cover about one sixth of the surface, but they're a veneer. They don't go deep at all. Well, in Chang'e, we went to a Mara uh, sinus iridium part. Uh, I have an offshoot of Mara embryum. So it really, um, that they don't, they don't bear much on uh, what, what I discussed, but there, there, there weren't any uh, tremendous disparity between uh, what had been measured from orbit by reflectance and other techniques and, and what those samples showed. Uh, uh, Spectral reflectance is, is, has its problems at this extreme and orthocytic end of the lunar composition range, but I think it's it's uh, in in addition to which other virtues, it it's, doesn't have the same for that kind of uh, composition like uh, the Chang'e five uh, material. Okay, Pablo, um, Juliet has a number of questions for you, including Great. one that came in before you opened your mouth. Oh, okay. So the first question we have here is, does the maturation index account for the effects of space weathering and patina development on the surfaces of samples? Well, short answer is no, unfortunately. Uh, as I mentioned, there's been a little bit of work done on, uh, uh, there was a mar basalt and maybe a uh, noritic impact melt breccia. It was a Apollo 17 sample. Anyway, there are no Apollo 17 samples uh, bigger than five millimeter or something that uh, have this kind of an orthocytic composition of the, uh, that it totally from the lunar highlands. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, I, I maybe somebody is gonna prove me wrong and say, there is something in the literature. <laughs> there ought to be. And I, I would say uh, one of the main recommendations I would make off of this recent study I've been doing with Randy Korotev uh, is, uh, by golly, it's high time somebody looked at the effect of that patina. Because the place you don't have regolith, regolith is going to be mixed. It's 
it's hopeless to expect to find a super pure composition of an orthocyte in regular samples, I believe. But if you go to the tops of some boulders, you might find exposed rock, but then that rock's gonna have this patina. And I don't think they have studied that. It's, it's amazing to me. Uh, they ought to be done. So our next question is, does the grain size and composition have a major effect on regolith radiation protection for future astronauts who will live underground? Um, no, I would say uh, the, the, the important thing is going to be the towards being underground. You simply want to insert mass between yourself and the uh, the radiation coming cosmic radiation coming down from space, and uh, the the most mature soil is going to be a little less dense. Uh, well, soil is is less dense than rock on the moon by far, but the, the, the once you form a soil, albeit an immature soil. Uh, its density is going to be the, the range of density is going to be too great, unless unless one were to work with soil from the top centimeter or so, where we don't have a good handle on that density. But uh, no, you, if you just take bulk soil the way it would be done, people are going to scoop up big bucketfuls. Um, no, I wouldn't. Grain size would be uh, having a big effect there. And we have another question that was emailed to us. It's a little bit longer, so I'll ask a portion of the question, but forward the email to you to respond um, in full. But the question is, FEO is out by a factor of three when, or as I understand it, FEO is out by a factor of three when telescope data, such as uh, reflection, gamma ray, x-ray spectroscopy trained on the moon surface is compared to that applied in experiments on lunar meteorite samples. The molecules that are focused upon being feldspar and the FE-enriched feldspar in orthocyte. Apart from just minerals, could the FEO factor of three be due to another type of molecule in one of the entities? Uh, well, yeah, I, I saw this question. Uh, short answer, I'm afraid, is no. I, I think, like I said, I think lunar mineralogy is pretty simple. There are some complications at the very surface where you have uh, debris from impactors. Uh, but the factor of three that I mentioned in my abstract is uh, just relates to this mineral feldspar, plagioclase feldspar. And uh, mm, not, so it's, it's limited to the one mineral is a short answer. Any other questions, Juliet? I don't see any in the chat and I can't see anyone with their hand raised, but if your hand is raised, speak now. So Pablo, while we're waiting for uh, any other potential questions, uh, what is the bottom line moral lesson of your talk? <laughs> Well, I hope it isn't that spec. I don't want to say that spectral reflectance is, is junk. It's just that uh, it's overinterpreted. Uh, it has been misinterpreted, I'm afraid. And uh, it, that the even more on a basic, more basic level is that ground truth is, is should be consulted anytime you apply remote sensing to some compositional extreme. Let me just say that, you know, I mentioned gamma ray and how gamma ray spectroscopy did a fine job, I think, for the in terms of accuracy for AL203. Uh, and, and by proxy there for plagioclase and matrix silicate abundances. But it had its own problems. And the first, first calibration that came out for, for gamma ray spectroscopy where it, its strongest thing is that it can measure thorium and uranium, uh, these uh, elements that are uh, ideally uh, prone to stay and melt and not enter into crystals. And so their behavior is, is very uh, interesting and, and predictable 
among lunar materials. Um, so it, it's the technique is really well suited to measure those. And eventually we got that right. And, and, it, and it turns out uh, to be a, a really great asset, the maps that we get from, the, from that. But that first calibration was all wrong because uh, they, they, they had made an assumption that the lowest measurement they got in terms of counts per second was higher than zero in terms of the amount of thorium. Mm, but that's not right <laughs> uh, because uh, there's a background uh, of counts and there's a scatter, a Gaussian statistical scatter. Uh, and they did thousands of measurements and each with significant uncertainty. So when you, you take the low end of the results, that's gonna be something controlled by the uncertainty in your data and the number of measurements you make. And that can be a big distance away from the actual lowest real value. And that's a mistake that I think also comes into play with this claim for the identification of these very pure homocytes. The same problem um, which uh, the remote sensing people need to appreciate. Uh, I hope that answered that question. There's nothing like having a sample in your hands. Well, you can do, you know, you can measure everything to, to, to great precision. Uh, you can apply a variety of techniques. Uh, you know, it's just, there is no comparison between what we can achieve in a lab and what you can do with even the most sophisticated uh, remote sensing or even landers, you know, uh, rovers, uh, rowing missions uh, have their place. I wouldn't, I hope people don't get too excited about uh, exclusively reliance, exclusive reliance on rovers when uh, for a lot of uh, lunar uh, questions when we can sample the moon uh, without going to too much greater expense and, and get real definitive answers. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, it's getting to the bottom of the hour. Uh, we'll end the session now. Thank you very much, Paul. We all appreciate it. Okay, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, I will pleasure. read um, next month's lecture. Oh, please, go ahead, Julia. Yes. So on March 20th, Dr. Rhonda Stroud from the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory will talk about a first look at Hayabusa 2 return samples from asteroid Ryogu. Ryogu. Okay, thank you. Cool, thanks. Bye, Bye everybody.